Hi and welcome along to what is today our 15th past conversation. Great today to be joined by Jesse Alexander, who is the host of the Great War channel on YouTube. Hi Jesse, thanks very much for joining me today. Thanks a lot, Paul. I'm uh, happy to be here. Now, Jesse, one of the questions that um, anyone who watches this uh, this channel will know is that I, I ask everyone basically about their memories of studying history at a young age and at school. So I wonder for you, anything anything that stands out about school and about history? Well, in a way, I mean, I, I've, I've watched some of your previous speakers and I'm glad that it seems that most of them had a great experience uh, learning history in high school. But to be quite honest, high school was not the main driver of my interest in history. I have a lot of mixed memories of high school. History wasn't uh, a really important subject for my school. We only had like two required government classes for the whole five years we were at the school. And most of the teachers who taught those classes weren't specialized in history. So to me, high school classroom history was not, not really the thing. I remember I had one teacher, she'd been teaching there when my father was attending that high school. Not that that's a bad thing, but in her case, I think uh, there was a bit of routine. So our routine every day in class was she would stand up at the blackboard and write out the notes of whatever colonial Canadian history topic was of the day. And we would copy those notes off of the blackboard into our notebooks for 50 minutes. And that was essentially my main uh, high school history experience. But it was outside of high school that I really got into history, mostly because of my family, I have to say. Um, I grew up in the countryside on a farm, big kind of traditional family. We'd been farming that land for a long time uh, since we came from the UK and Ireland a couple of centuries ago. And so it was like my grandparents' stories about previous generations and finding old horse harnesses in the shed and asking my father what they were for and hearing kind of stories about working with horses. And so that kind of stuff really fired my imagination when I was a kid and, and also when I was a teenager, uh, far more than anything in school. Plus, my grandfather was a World War II veteran, and he told me all sorts of stories. I realize, of course, in retrospect, he edited those for, uh, for child, childhood consumption. But nonetheless, this was like, this was really what got me into history, um, much more than school. So maybe I'm a bit of an outlier in that sense, but that's, that's kind of how it worked for me. Now, Jess, something that I've been very much looking forward to talking to you about is the, the Great War YouTube channel. Now, you are the host of it, have been now for, for almost two years, and I know myself as a, as a history teacher, it's a, a source of information that I tend to, to go to quite a lot, um, both for myself and for, for students at school. So for anyone that perhaps doesn't know what the channel is about, could, could you tell us? Yeah, sure. Um... The channel actually began in 2014 before my involvement with the team there. And it was kind of a pioneering uh, idea on YouTube where the original host, Indy Nidell, an American host, he sat in a, in a studio on YouTube and every week he sort of brought everybody up to speed on what was happening 100 years ago during the Great War. Now the original concept for the channel was that it would run for four years from 2014 to 2018 the armistice comes and that's kind of that's the project right but what happened was and how i kind of uh got involved is that the crew on the team decided you know there's a lot of history that happens after the armistice that's related to the war and that's we think would be interesting and important for a general audience who, who likes history or teachers and students and so they founded a startup company, got a deal to continue the, the channel in the same way with the same you know, audience and, and name and all of that, but they needed a new host. And I was sitting at home, maybe procrastinating, I'm not gonna confirm or deny that, but maybe procrastinating on a project and uh, looking at YouTube. Uh, I'm sure no one watching this can relate to that. And um, I saw, that they were looking for a new host. And I was working in a, in a kind of office job at the time and decided, ah, what have I got to lose? So 
I made a little pitch video saying how interested I was, kind of citing some of my experience as a battlefield tour guide. And I did a master's degree in history. And I spoke a few different relevant languages like French and German and Russian. And lo and behold, they picked me. And so uh, we've been working together on this since uh, January 2019 in the sort of immediate post-war period. And it's a lot of fun. It's also a lot of work. There's what you see on the screen is just kind of, let's say, the, the tip of the iceberg, right? And of course, it's not me doing everything. There's like a producer, there's sound guys, there's guys who do the map animations, there's guys who fact check my stuff, there's guys who help me with research. Um, so it's kind of, it's a bit of a, a symphony orchestra and I just happen to be the face that, uh, that presents it. Although I do uh, the research and the writing as well, most of the time. You are someone who is clearly passionate about the First World War. I mean, you have to be, you have to be. Um, and the obvious question, therefore, from my, you know, kind of perspective speaking to you today is, um, are there any particular aspects of the First World War that maybe just slightly interest you more than others? Oh, you're killing me, man. Like, how can, how can I answer this kind of uh, question in the time that we have? But I'll give it a shot. I mean... Uh, one thing that's important, I think my, my interest has also sort of evolved over time. It's not always the same thing, right? Not, not everybody who is interested in history or wants to work in history, as uh, some of your students might do back at uh, Clydebank, um, you know, sticks to one topic forever. Um, in my case, what first got me interested, I would say were, I guess I'd frame it like this, were like facts and emotions, if I, can, if I can put it that way. I remember the first time I really got interested in, in World War I, sorry, the First World War for your UK uh, viewers, um, was in high school, I watched a documentary. It was a, a, a significant documentary by an American uh, channel, PBS. And I was just fixated by the actors reading excerpts from letters and diaries. This was like, such an enthralling uh, thing for me at the time, which uh, is probably proof of my nerdiness in high school. But nonetheless, on the long haul, it was a, it was a great thing. And that kind of uh, stuck with me. At first, I just wanted to absorb more facts and more experiences and how many collections of letters and diaries can I read and, and how many more of these emotions can I discover that people were feeling during this you know, cataclysmic event. And then I went to university and I started to kind of understand a bit more what the study of history really is, right? What's the meaning of it? How do we try to understand it? How do we use evidence and different methodologies to make some sense of those facts and emotions rather than just kind of experiencing and collecting them up, which is kind of what I wanted to do before. So university really kind of changed the, the ball game, so to speak, for me in that sense. And I started to get a lot more interested in some of the debates about it. You know, why did the war start? And uh, how can we assess the peace treaties? And why did the allies win and the Germans lose? You know, how did they fight and why? All those kinds of things. And the later phase, I would say, has kind of accompanied some other changes in my life where I moved from Canada to Europe. I live in Austria now and have lived here for 10 years. And I got a lot more interested in travel to Eastern Europe. And I've been to Russia a bunch of times and Ukraine and so on. And um, now I'm really interested, if so to speak, in the other side of the coin. So what are these other perspectives? I mean, I grew up being so much more familiar with the British Empire point of view, let's say, uh, during the wars, and that's connected to my own family. But what were the Austro-Hungarians doing and thinking? And what about the Russians? I mean, you know, Austria-Hungary doesn't exist anymore. The Russian Empire doesn't exist anymore. We have a direct link in the UK and in Canada and France as well, among others. We have a direct link to these events because we're still kind of think of ourselves as the same community now as was then but for people living in the former austria-hungary or in russia 
they don't quite always think the same way, especially in the former Austria-Hungary. So now I'm really interested in how do they think and what were the priorities of people at the time and why did they think these things were, were important or how did they live these experiences given that their idea, this organizing idea of a country and a, and a, a nation state community is completely different uh, over the course of their history than it is uh, for us. And just lastly, Jesse, before we, we finish up, I'm just curious if you were to speak to a young person today and they were to ask you about a, a career in history, is there any particular advice that you might give to them? Well, I mean, it might seem like I've achieved a kind of dream a career in history. And of course, I'm very happy with the ended up, with where I ended up. But um, the roads can be different to get to where you want to go. And I think the, the main thing I would uh, probably start by saying is you don't have to have a fixed plan, right? I think a lot of people when they're, when they're finishing up high school deciding what program do I want to study at university or what course uh, do I want to study at university, they feel like this is, you know, the be all and end all. And parents, I have to admit, uh, sometimes contribute to that uh, idea, right? This is an investment for the family and we don't want to quote unquote wasted on a topic like history that might not have such a clearly definable path to one job and, you know, one way of making a living and so on. You can get to different places in all sorts of ways and it's still going to be all good. And you can still find places to be satisfied with your development. Um, if I think back to when I was making that decision, my parents They'd never been to university, um, but they valued education a lot. They were concerned about my security as well. So I was interested in history, but I was also not so bad at, you know, science and math. So their advice was, well, why don't you go and study science or business? And then you're like safe, right? And then if you want to study history after, you've got a safety net of something that will get you a job. Um, and I didn't listen to that advice. And uh, I'm kind of glad that I didn't. I'm also glad that my parents then accepted that and supported me um, throughout my studies and other, other career choices and so on. Um, but I ended up doing a master's, but it took me 14 years to go back and finish it after I interrupted it. I ended up living in four different countries. I ended up doing a whole bunch of work at different times that was not related to history. I spent 10 years working in the administration and student services of uh, universities for a very short period of time. And I'm not recommending this as a career option, but uh, you know, I moved furniture uh, in Berlin when I couldn't find a job for a while. So, and I still ended up where I am now. Uh, which is working as a, as a public historian. So there are all sorts of different ways that you can, you can achieve stuff. And studying history doesn't necessarily mean you're going to work in history. And not studying history doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to work in history. So there, um, the options are, are quite open. And I would say that even if you feel like maybe studying history at university is... Uh, not necessarily statistically the highest chance of getting quote unquote a good job, however you, might def however you might define that. If you like history, go and do it because uh, you're going to benefit from history, studying history in all sorts of different ways. I mean, it's not just about accumulating knowledge. It's not just about sort of arcane, you know, ivory tower, uh, obscure scholarly study of angels dancing on the head of a pin or whatever, you're going to gain skills like I did that I used at all my other non-history jobs that are good for all sorts of things. You're going to think critically. You're going to be able to write and express yourself. You're going to be able to structure your thought. You're going to be able to analyze situations. You're going to be able to understand the context of different situations. And uh, now maybe I'm going out on a limb here, but you might even be able to be a bit better placed to see through a bit of the politics of the current day. 
and try to understand that situation at a bit of a, a deeper level. So for me, it's kind of a life decision as much as it is a career decision and careers can, can have, you know, a winding path as much, um, as much as a life can, I suppose. That would be the, the kind of Cole's notes uh, version of that. If I, if I had to add one practical point, I would say, if you really want to benefit the most uh, from, your, from your history studies and you want to maximize your chances of getting a job in the field and being able to kind of show yourself as like a, a candidate that has maybe a bit more to offer than the next guy or gal, um, learn a language, a foreign language. This is like every job I ever got from being a, okay, every job I ever got except the farmhand shoveling manure. Uh, language requirement was not huge for that. But every job I had afterwards depended on language. I, I was a tour guide at the Canadian Parliament, had to know both national languages, English and French. Then I was an English substitute teacher uh, in a Berlin high school for a while. Well, I taught English, but I had to know German. And then, you know, it just goes on. And part of the reason I got the job at the Great War and also doing some of the other independent documentary films that, uh, that I work on outside of the, the Great War, it's not my only uh, project. If I, if I didn't know German, there would be, you know, I would definitely uh, not feel like I would be able to contribute as much. And the same, the same from the, the companies that I work with. So uh, that would be my one kind of hard skill practical advice. Go for the languages. Uh, I know it's tough for us in, in Canada, US and UK because we're used to, you know, other people learning English, but it is worth it.